and welcome to the Randomly Generated History Club, where three non-historians pick a year at random and try to learn things about it. I'm Anna, and I'm here with my two friends, Ant and Will. Hello. Hello. Uh, And this week, we're talking about the year 1133, a banner year in history. And uh, (laughs) to whet our collective appetite, I thought it would be fun if each of us could give a three-word preview of what we're discussing today. Uh Okay. Ant? Yeah, for my topic in 1133, my three-word teaser <laughs> is powerful angel number. Ooh. That's... Gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you're all thinking. 17. <laughs> well, actually, 1133. Oh, okay, and, right, right, and right. This is relevant to this episode, <laughs> <Okay>. yeah. <laughs> all right, Will? Um, lies about kings. Ooh. Mm. Uh, that's amazing. And mine would be Jaffa Cakes Coo. <laughs> Jaffa Cakes coup. Yeah. Jaffa Cakes coup. Brilliant. <laughs> is this the whole Jaffa Cakes or Cakes because of tax reasons thing? Uh, you know, you'll just Does have to Does it go back to 1133? <laughs> it goes back all the way. Um, great. So that's 1133 and here we go. Okay, great. So I actually want to start with a confession. Um I found several things that I wanted to discuss today, but they all happened in either 1132 or 1134. (laughs) Um, I think the world just sort of took 1133 off, uh, at least according to my research. Um, And because I don't want to be responsible for anyone getting this wrong on a history test, the event I'm talking about today was originally dated to 1132, then revised by later historians to be not before 1133, but probably in 1134. Wait. (laughs) So I, I'm so confused by this. Yeah. First of all, that would be a bad test <laughs> if they're asking this question. <laughs> um, well, I just, I think for our purposes, because history is not sure, we are just going to take it on faith that the following mm. incident happened in 1133. Okay, so we're, we're potentially rewriting history, yes. but no one's sure. Okay, yeah. good. I'm on board. We have that power. I'm on, and there was Jaffa Cakes. I think this is accurate enough for our purposes. Yes, yeah. exactly. Uh, so here we go. It's uh, 1133. A brief scene setting, we're in the Kingdom of Jerusalem, which was established after the First Crusade and is still in Christian control here around about 30 years later. Uh, King Baldwin II had no male heirs, so he wanted his daughter, and now I keep thinking it says Melisandre, like the (laughs) character from Game of Thrones, but there's no R in there, so (laughs) Melisandre, um, to succeed him. So he wants his daughter to succeed him. Yay, women! But just as a hedge, because it's the 12th century and men probably think all women are witches, he wants to marry her off to a powerful lord, just in case. Just in case. Just in case. Uh, A suitable lord presents himself, but this guy wants to be the only ruler, not just the queen's consort. And Baldwin holds firm uh, in defense of his daughter and comes up with a compromise, which is that they'll be co-rulers. So when Baldwin dies, we have a queen and king of Jerusalem. And this king's name, I love, and it's uh, one letter away from the word funk. And I'd, I'd like your best guesses. <laughs> Is as... it the N that's replaced with something? Cause, well. You know. Um, dunk. Good guess. <laughs> Alec Baldwin's son-in-law, Dunk. Could be King Dunk, Will. One letter. One letter away from funk. Um, is it Fink? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it is neither Dunk nor Fink. His name is Falk. Folk. <laughs> Folk. F-U-L-K. F-U-L-K. That's a noble name. Which is gosh. just a really sort of beautiful, <laughs> beautiful name. It's a, it's a miracle that it hasn't uh, made it into circulation. Apologies to all the folks out there. Uh, so, yeah, we've got King Folk and Queen, not Melisandre. Uh, they're nominally in charge together, but guess what? King Folk is a huge asshole and pretty much immediately excludes the queen from any role in ruling the kingdom. He also favors nobles from his own region of France at the expense of the existing nobles. He doesn't win over any hearts and minds in the in the uh, kind of surrounding crusader states. And that's possibly partly because he was famous for being unable to remember faces and names, <laughs> <laughs> wow. which is tough when you're trying to shore up support amongst say, your allies. You know, folk yeah. this guy. F- folk this guy, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> um So, because of all of this, he's realizing that his grasp on power is pretty tenuous. Um, So, he decides to stir some shit up and engage in palace intrigue. He cooks up a story that Melisanda is having an affair with Hugh, Count of Jaffa. 
Ah, ah. Right. here we go. Now, Jaffa is a, a place. <laughs> yes. But it is also, for the non-British listeners, and I know I'm going to get hate for this, a really sort of underwhelming, <laughs> Whoa, dry, wow. cakey, Whoa. biscuit, orange and chocolate flavored. Oh, wow. That is a we're alienating a lot of people. I know. Yeah. Both people that don't know what a Jaffa cakes are and then people that do know what a Jaffa cakes are and ab- objectively know that Given it's a good thing. Given you're dealing with the historical territory of Israel and Palestine, I think that is the most divisive thing you're going to say today. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I'm willing to die on this hill. So, uh, Hugh, Count of Jaffa cakes. Um, Hugh actually, to, to confront these accusations, Hugh knows he's going to need to raise an army to actually fight Falk, uh, and he allies himself with a Muslim state, uh, a kind of a province in Egypt, to fight the army that Falk raises against him. But in these crusading times, allying with the Muslims is a big no-no for Christians. Uh, so the church exiles Hugh, who, remember, did nothing wrong. Did nothing wrong, except <laughs> yeah. for he was accused of having an affair with Melisandre. Yeah, which he didn't. Okay. And so he's just trying to, like raise an army to defend himself, throws out an olive branch, and then gets just totally banned from the kingdom because of it. And if that weren't enough for poor Hugh of Jaffa, Falk then tries to assassinate Hugh, uh-huh. who again has done nothing <laughs> wrong. <laughs> He's committed to the lie. He's yeah. got to keep doubling <laughs> yeah, down. Yeah, exactly. So uh, Falk sends a guy to stab uh, Hugh. Hugh doesn't die. Folk has covered his tracks enough that no one can say definitively if, if it was him. But I think to be fair on on Folk, yeah. I mean once you've once you've accused someone of having an affair with your partner in these circumstances, yeah. it would be embarrassing not to try and have them killed. Yeah. Yes, you know, yeah, I yeah, think, yeah, yeah, yeah. To so, give him as Jews, he's really got a safe face. Yeah, completely a face that he doesn't recognize. He's, he's quite but... a sympathetic character. I'm not <laughs> <Yeah. gonna lie. laughs> I know that you would take Folk's side. I'm surprised he remembered you's name and face. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, so he's exactly. just going out there trying to assassinate random people. Yeah, he may have just hired people to stab willy nilly. All the Hughes. Yeah, all the Hughes. <laughs> just go into a square, shout Hugh. At that time, there's lots of them. Of course. This is the persecution of the Hughes I keep hearing this about. Persecution of the Hughes. Um, so, anyway, I think everyone agrees that it was Folk. Folk has completely lost the support of the people. I mean, for understandable reasons. And uh, Queen Melisandre has enough reason to openly challenge him. So she and her supporters effectively stage a coup and Falk slips into the background and sort of walks around the palace in terror and she's really responsible for all the running of the kingdom. Yay, women. How about her? Uh, yeah, yeah. So she, you know, she gets the last laugh in the end. But she's mounted a coup. Yes. Well, is it a coup if she's actually in charge? Yes, of course it is. Well, what do you mean? and is it a coup if it's against her husband who has accused her of having an affair which she didn't have he was actively cooing against her i would say like sub threshold <laughs> cooing yeah. was happening yeah he tried guy. to coo from the get-go yeah yeah so it's a counter coup of anything which i yeah. believe is just reinstating the rule of law exactly and i'm on her side and if baldwin had had i mean to be fair baldwin had a lot of faith in his daughter if he had had 10 percent more faith and just Come let on, her this, rule on his own is this on her kingdom own. of heaven baldwin is this- um it is this is about Two generations before Kingdom of Heaven. Okay, okay. I knew you would bring that up. So, so Orlando <laughs> Bloom's film. grandfather. Yes. Uh, uh, grandmother. Grandmother. Right. Sibylla. Eva Green's grandmother. Got it. Okay. Interesting. Right. So Eva Green, not yet born. <laughs> yeah. But is reaping the consequences of decisions in the Kingdom of... I've never seen that film. Exactly. Oh, well, you must. Uh, I, I, that I will. will be a... That will be a, a, a group up. outing, yeah. Uh, and I just have a quick postscript here. Um, there's good and bad news, depending on how you feel about Falk. Bro. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the good news for you. Uh-huh. Uh, he and Melisandre did reconcile in the end. Oh, thank goodness. Yeah, they had another child and, um, oh, you know, things warming. things got a little bit better. So love, love conquers oh, all. I'm so pleased. Uh, the bad news for you, Will, oh is that he, Falk did die a few years after all of this by falling off his horse, um, 
which is an ignominious way to go, I would say. Uh, And according to historians, his skull was crushed by the saddle and, quote, his brains gushed forth from both ears and nostrils. You're right. This is a less happy ending than you first led us to believe it to be. I suppose... I I did say there was good news and bad news. (laughs) In the 12th century, I mean, like, falling off your horse must have just been the the car crash of its day, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, You know, everyone's falling off horse. Yeah, exactly. Okay, good. So he had a pretty pretty big fall. But... um, How tragic, though. Thus ends the tale of King Falk of Jerusalem. Well, it's a much better ending for the woman in the story than I think most of history would. Yeah, I know. Yeah, because she kind of, (laughs) she survived um, after him and she had some quarrels with her sons for a while, but then they reconciled. And I think in the end, she maybe went off to an an abbey and became a nun. So, you know, she's... Did she live to see Eva Green and Orlando Bloom hook up? Because uh, <laughs> I think in that extremely factual interpretation of history, <laughs> yes, she did. It oh, can't goodness. be any less factual than what we're saying. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so that is something that was happening in or around 1133. In Probably not before. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not before. Certainly not after 1134. Okay. okay. Yes. So we're, we're there or thereabouts. We're there, there or thereabouts. thereabouts. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll yeah. follow And I promise I'll never fudge the dates again <laughs> don't promise things yeah, you until can't, you possibly can't next episode there's more fudge coming there's so much fudge <laughs> just jaffa cakes of fudge speaking of fudge will how did you get on this week it's gone okay i have also struggled to find authoritative evidence uh, to support what i've been looking into but i i, I I've, I've been looking into uh, the historia regum britanniae uh, <laughs> otherwise known as the history of the kings of britain by a guy called jeffrey of Monmouth. <laughs> Jeffrey of Monmouth. It's just, wow. what a name. Yeah, it's a great name. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, so the, he, he's reasonably well known. Um, and, and I think, so again, it was definitely published in or about 1133. Yeah. It could have been a bit later. Mm-hmm. Um, but for the purposes of this conversation, I think it's like, it's accurate enough. Uh, and and it's, it's uh, basically uh, become really quite influential and really unjustifiably influential in the uh, understanding of uh, the early Middle Ages and the Dark Ages and the sense that the British people like, had about themselves, despite, as will become clear, uh, being largely bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I sort of thought it was going to go that way because Jeff, a historian, yeah. didn't even put the date at which he made his history book. Yeah. No, he, he skimped on a lot of detail. <laughs> Uh, that, was, that was just the fun, just the just the start uh, of it, really. So, so yeah, it's it's and it, he's he was not a historian uh, by any stretch of the imagination or any kind of like mo- by any con- modern concept that we would have of the word history. You know, he that was not what he was trying to do. So, what he was trying to do was take. Um, uh, stories that existed in sort of the folklore and the folk stories that existed in uh, Britain at the time, sent, uh, sent like, other other mythologies that were around, and some things that might have had a factual basis, but well, are like not very well supported, and then trying to weave them together into like a compelling narrative of mm. the things that could okay. have been part of the history of the Britons, um, and uh, and that's kind of what he was trying to do, really. So, but but he was, I mean, Geoffrey himself was kind of an interesting dude. So he. He was, at this time, wasn't particularly well known, and um, although he had published in books before, which I'll come on to, but he was really just kind of one of these people who was part of the um, English aristocracy at the time. So it was the Norman French speaking aristocracy. When they were writing, they were writing in Latin, uh, and he was, as, as many of them were in the aristocracy, you know, they were either right at the senior levels of of like royalty and around the court or the other option was that they were in some degree connected with religion and like uh, and the catholic church at the time which is like the other you know air sort of center of power and by the way actually as as an aside here so he was later ordained as the bishop of uh, saint asaph and interestingly uh, saint asaph is now in the uk the second smallest city in the uk oh. yeah suitably interested and intrigued noises there uh, and <laughs> yeah. and it's about two and a half it's two and a half square miles and the population's about three thousand but here's a question for you both don't shout out do you know where in the uk is the smallest city i uh, do actually know this oh. <laughs> i'm gonna win back some love of the british people after yeah. excoriating jaffa cakes i believe the answer is saint david's in wales that is incorrect oh, oh. damn it that is a very good i'm gonna guess, guess wild card liverpool 
<laughs> <laughs> I think it's much smaller than people actually claim it to be. Oh, well, I'm afraid you're both wrong. Uh, the answer is, in fact, potentially a quite infuriating answer. The answer is the square mile, the city of London, which oh, comes in it is. at oh, a it much is. smaller, a, a much smaller such square. A boring QI type <laughs> fact. <laughs> you really the got it. The buzzer's going. Yeah. St. Oh. David's, 10 points off. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's fascinating. That is fascinating. Yeah, and, sorry, uh, this is great. But uh, also the population of the square mile is also actually, like people who actually live there is quite low. It's about 7,000. So it, even in population terms, it's, it's really quite low. Anyway. Press so, managers. But um, at the time, anyway, he went on later to become Bishop of St. Asaph. At the time, it was a bit of a kind of religious power base insofar as um, religious power bases were, were, went in, uh, in Wales. Um, but at this time, he hadn't met his reputation, sort of made his reputation at all. Um, and um, anyway, so, so he was basically trying to write a book and set out to write a history of Britain because he probably thought it would sell pretty well. And that's really what it was about. Yeah, because um, a lot of people were buying books in 1133. In if I, yeah. In, in well, England. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, I, it actually, I mean, it, I know you might you might poo poo the readership. Um, I mean, there, were, there weren't airports full of um, yeah. of Stephen oh, King novels. The, let me get the latest John Grisham and also a history of the Wait. kings of Britain. Yeah, uh, okay. are we pre printing press or post printing press? Pre. Pre. Well pre, well pre. pre. Yeah, so yeah, like, yeah. But this not book only went when, viral. If he sold it, he'd have to just write more of it. No, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, he would have to like to just, just crank them all them. out with his no, 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 own. No, no, no. It, it, went, it, went, it went completely viral. Um, <laughs> as far as vi- like, as viral as things can go, when you need them to be like hand copied by monks <laughs> who speak Latin <laughs> at the speed of a thousand monks yeah. yeah yeah so like a really slow like lethargic virus um, <laughs> and, uh, and 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 and, like, and then obviously in the way that things do there's then a whole branch of the investigation into this um, book around like the different um, ways in which it's evolved the different people copied it out in different ways and inserted different um, passages and things into it but importantly the success of the thing exceeded his wildest expectations and it became to some degree Degree, the like the authoritative account of the the early days of British uh, of British kings um, and it's all basically woven mythology made up completely. stuff. Completely. Wow. So so one of the central tenets of the whole thing is how the, the early British kings came to the came to Britain from the descendants of the Trojans. Um, and huh. <laughs> so so he, so he's like adopted. Um, he's like or, or co opted. Like you know the, the, this existing mythological yeah. um, sort of. Um, um, corpus that existed and then try to connect British legitimacy to yeah, the legitimacy yeah, yeah. that the Romans derived from the Trojans. Cloaking them in somebody else's glory, yeah, basically. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and then very interestingly, it's also the first time that we see uh, in like widespread published uh, books anything about King Lear. So as a figure, okay. it's where, oh, okay. it's where King, like the public understanding of King Lear came from this. And the reason Shakespeare hundreds of years later wrote a play about it was because of the how famous he was from like in the ways presented in this book. And then um, and and then and then the other way in which he influences like the zeitgeist is uh, with <laughs> with King Arthur. <laughs> oh, so he um, invented King Arthur as well. Didn't invent him at all. But what he had done was so it, in the same way actually that that Tolkien did with Tom Bombadil. <laughs> <laughs> Which is to say, Tom Bombadil was like in a in a book he had written already years before, and then he tried to like basically shoehorn him in, shoehorn him in for the yeah. merch up, which is why it all feels yeah. so shoehorn. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, he did the same thing with Merlin here, where so he had okay. ri- he had written a book called The Prophecies of Merlin years before, about. 15, 20 years before. And then basically everything he wrote in that book about Merlin, he then tried to shoehorn into the account of Arthur and made up a whole bunch of embellishments and that sort of thing. And but and it, but but that then become became part of this idea that that maybe they were real like yeah, real yeah. pseudo real like figures yeah. which then which then carried on into the middle ages, into the late middle ages. Before you doubt him too much, just wait um <laughs> wait until you hear his own his own sources uh, for for the, for the books. Uh, so both for the Merlin one and for the history of the kings of Britain. They all come from, uh, and I quote from Geoffrey, his own translation of an ancient book, he found. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, No, no, it's totally uh, legit. I found this book. I can't show it to you, but it's definitely (laughs) real. My girlfriend who lives in Canada gave it to me. Exactly. (laughs) And we translated it together. And here it is. And also, is... Merlin was there. <laughs> yeah. So I think that is all you really need to know about Jeffrey of Monmouth. Yeah. Top, top notch historian. I can't wait for the Netflix adaptation of the Historiana Regum Britanniae. Nailed it. <laughs> Got it in that, one. That's great. I mean, Jeff sounds like, you know, he, he made a lot of bank on this, I'm assuming. 
Well, I, I don't think he, he didn't live that much longer, but, oh. yeah, but he. <laughs> well, yeah. And also, it it's one of these ones that I think so, so slow, such was the slowness with which it became famous. Oh, okay. He didn't really like gotcha. get much out of it. You know, he was. Okay. Yeah. It's incredible because that's informed the sort of mythology of the English foundation myth. You know, uh, for centuries. Yeah, after. but it's one of these ones that you know it got a cult following, and then it grew into a mainstream following. Like, yeah. um, um, and people are arguing who believed it first. <laughs> Shawshank Redemption. Okay, Whoa. all right. You, you heard you heard it here first. Jeffrey of Monmouth wrote the Shawshank Redemption <laughs> because that, we can just make things up like he did. <laughs> that, <laughs> but no, that wasn't a, that wasn't a popular film when it came out, and it's only later yeah. that it became uh, you know became a like a, a popular thing. Get I busy think. living or get busy casting spells and drawing swords out of Van Gogh or something. Van Gogh, another one, also existed. Yeah, okay. <laughs> this is the time in the podcast when we just shout things that exist in the world. <laughs> well, maybe this is a good time to segue um, to. Well, speaking of made up things. Uh, 1133. Uh-huh. So what I discovered this week is that the thing about history is there is quite a lot of it. <laughs> <laughs> and once you uncover one thing, you just uncover just it spirals. strata and strata. I would almost say decades worth of intrigue. Wow. Um, so first of all, I think I need to uh, start off where I searched. Quick Google search. Um, and the first thing you come up with when you type in 1133 is a website claiming to explain the importance numerologically of the 1133, which, by the way, is a powerful angel number. And it says, and I quote, which, of course, is used to commune with your guardian angel. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> uh, I decided to back out of that one and go to more reputable sources. So there's a lot of books, a lot of uh, interesting places I, I, I dug in. But where I sort of fixed on is this chap called King Lothier III, or sometimes referred to as King Lothier II, very confusingly. <laughs> he was um, appointed by uh, Pope Innocent II, the uh, uh, emperor of, uh, of, of Rome, of the Holy Roman Empire. Innocent II appointed Lothier the Holy Roman Holy Empire. Holy Roman Empire, got em- it. Emperor. Okay. So, this requires a little bit of background. Of course, it goes back to the Romans originally. Yep. So, as we all know, Romans kind of like dwindled out, the Vandals, the Goths, etc., all ransacked them. And then there was sort of this gulf of power, and in came, at this time, uh, Charlemagne. And so Charlemagne then from uh, t- took up this mantle and expanded this massive empire across Europe. And he had this incredibly vast empire. Stri- I think I think that's quite a that's quite a precede history of the whole thing, isn't it? That's that's somewhat... Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay, good. So, like, uh, but that's, that happened well before 1133, <laughs> yeah, so I need can to... You, can you- when, can we have a rough time of Charlemagne? Yeah, about 800, uh, you know, kind of like at his peak, about eight, 850, I think, I want to okay, say. Okay, so okay. we're a couple um, hundred years Oh, yeah, a couple hundred years out at right. this stage. Um, so he, at the time, he became so popular, so vast, that the Pope at the time, Leo III, appointed him Holy Roman Emperor. Never done before, and then after him, it didn't happen for a while. Because, because he was, uh, uh, f- f- sort of had French background, he the tradition was that you split up your lands amongst your children. So he had six legitimate children and numerous illegitimate mm-hmm, children, mm-hmm. but only one of which got the land, but it still fell in disrepair. All his investments in the arts, he was never happy with his kingdom, but it kept getting breaking, breaking up and breaking up. This is where the, uh, the, where, where the, the, the Saxony Empire comes in. So the German Saxons, they had links to the English as well. They had a different tradition where actually you just appoint someone and your descendants get it. But they also had a very bizarre, unusual sort of system whereby they would appoint a king with this council of princes. There's, you know, floated between seven to 13 powerful princes in sort of the Germanic regions. And they would actually get around and appoint who should be the king of, uh, of Saxony and can go on expanding. And it was very, very political because it often wouldn't be go through the lineage and then you have all this infighting, I was the son of this king, etc. And therefore, I, it belongs to me, but then the vote goes elsewhere. Um, and the, the good thing about this, though, is it means it could consolidate power into one person, which is often a, a figurehead. So this person was not necessarily the best king or the strongest king. It was... <laughs> He was just the most palatable one by he was, this council of princes. He was just the most beige magnolia okay. prince, the, <laughs> yeah, the king great. that get along with. What a great way to choose a ruler. So King Lothier, uh, he got the descendancy of the crown from his father, King Henry V. Um, and he decided, you know what, we need to sort of rena- like these kingdoms and march on Italy. So throughout history in this sort of Holy Roman Empire, which is more of a concept, um, Otto I was the next one in line after a big gap from Charlemagne. He picked up the mantle of uh, Holy Roman Emperor, Emperor. 
because he basically instilled the Pope and he made a deal with them saying, hey, if you instill me as Holy Roman Emperor, I will sort of back your claim to, yeah. to, to, to the papacy. And it was very unusual because there was a lot of like unorthodoxies in the church. They hadn't had the Diet of Worms. They haven't had, had mm. all these things that have sort of, <laughs> the Diet of Worms is a, a, a famous event in the famous. history of the church. Trendy diet. Trendy, trendy diet. You eat nothing but worms for three days. Is this a, is this a Gwyneth? <laughs> <laughs> it is a goop. goop Straight from goop. Uh, a, a diet just means council, a uh, churchy type council. Uh, and they decide what do we believe in and they all come up with their ideas and then they choose, hey, this is what we believe in. Now you're heathens, you're excommunicated. Wow. Weird. Weird. There's a lot of like weird decision making happening. Oh, yeah. In the- and this, this is the thing. We, we just take for granted that the you know hereditary of, of, of kingdoms is sort of set in stone and the same with the papacy. There's a vote. There's none of this. So there was all these minority popes, and this is a time of anti-popes and mm. anti-kings being appointed, sort of political mm. reasons. And so um, King Lothi III was... I always thought I'd, I'd probably be an anti-pope. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I He's think got- you could be an anti basically any noun what would, an anti, <laughs> what would an anti-pope mobile look like i think it's just a convertible right <laughs> no no bulletproof yeah, yeah. covering i think no, it's just it's... a black blimp <laughs> dropping truth bombs <laughs> oh my god there's anti-pope will in his black blimp of truth <laughs> I'd, I'd go to church more often 100 yeah, percent. i'd do something that's for sure but king lothier was really concerned because um he was plagued by an intrigue of the Hohenstaffens, which were a rival sort of group of nobility in Saxony that were trying to um, trying to uh, t- take over. And so after, uh, in 1106, he was the Duke of Saxon, and 1130, uh, 1125 was made the King of Germany. He said, I need to consolidate my power and actually push into Italy, because Italy was like, you know, the Merovingians had long since descended from grace, and there's a sort of power vacuum there, and he wanted to be instilled as Holy Roman Emperor. So he marched from Germany to, uh, to Rome. It took him six months to get there. But when he did, uh, he sort of said, right, um, come at me. Uh, I'm gonna- <laughs> <laughs> Can I just, like, uh, I, I just, I don't think that necessarily respe- re- reflects the military reality of no. what might have occurred there. So he took six months to march yes. to Rome, and then he arrives and says, hey, well, it, come, he, at he, come at me. Come at me. Well, I'm, at me. I'm sure he said, cometh at me or something like that. But, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, Sorry, that was the bit I was quibbling. Yeah. Yeah, 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 what he did, towards me. What he did was he made a medieval dating profile saying, any would-be popes, oh. come flirt with me, oh. promise me the best thing that you can, and I will side with you. I've got the power, I've got the people, um, I've started to reunite Saxony and, and the Franco empires together, and I'm now in Italy just basically fucking with your shit. So, so he kind of, he was like craving the legitimacy that yes. a pope would grant Exactly. Him. So he backed... Um, so there was a minority pope elected okay. by the council of bishops, which was in, uh, Innocent II. And there was a majority pope voted by others um, called Anselitus. An- um, the reason I can't pronounce it is, guess what? Didn't actually become the pope. Okay. Because okay. they both promised him to to or, um, coronate him as the Holy Roman Empire, Emperor. Um, but then he backed Innocent because he just, uh, I don't know, just felt that connection a bit more. In it's the, got a better sure name, stage. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's like easier to, to sloganize oh, yeah, Innocent. Yeah. But one had the majority backing. So this is like a VHS yes. versus Betamax. 100%, yeah, and, yeah, but we're backing Betamax. I think we're, yes, I yeah. think that's right. Okay. Yeah. But as part of this, then what he was able to do is like instill himself as not just um, sort of secular ruler, but also as the ecclesiastical de facto ruler as well by you know, able to out a pope and able to set the terms by which he could actually excommunicate others who didn't agree with him. And that was obviously a massive deal. So if yeah. you were a bishop that disagreed with the appointment of Innocent II, you could find yourself on the wrong side of excommunication. Uh, so he was able to wield both the powers of, uh, you know, the land, sea, air, but also the fourth or fifth domain, which is uh, God. God. <laughs> <laughs> Multi-domain integration. Multi-domain integration. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, and there's a series of anti-popes and anti uh, anti-kings set up, including one of the Hohenstaffens, which is Conrad the mm. Third, definitely just the third, not maybe a second, who um, was constantly bickering at the side, saying, "Actually, you know what? I'm actually the king, and then this is the actual pope that you know everyone should believe with some guy that he found, scrubbed up, put in a white, you know, like Jeffrey office. finding that book. Yeah. Everyone <laughs> is just finding convenient things for them to advance <laughs> their own power. Uh, exactly, and uh, he." Tied uh, England to Saxony through marriage as well. His first wife did die. She then went, she, before she died, she went on to, to, to be one of the ruling figureheads in I- English history. Um, but when he went to march to Sicily, which was one of the... Sorry, is this Conrad or... No, no, no. Conrad's going to come in soon. Okay. Because as he, as, as uh, 
Lothier III went down to Sicily to trample them, because obviously they weren't having any of this, the Sicilians. Yeah. He, on his way back, he was making all these edicts about, you know, who should take over my throne. He died on the way back. Uh, he gave his Oof. seal to his son, which everyone thought this is, you know, him appointing his heir. But Conrad and his anti-pope were having none of that. And so Conrad III <laughs> oh snuck in there and just established himself as the next Holy Roman Emperor. Wow. Yeah. So he just took it from him. He basically just took it. All that he worked for, uniting Italy, France, Germany, and I guess in theory, parts of sort of the English royal society. Well, you've got to, you've got to be there. Timing is everything at these moments. Yeah. It's why when rulers are getting ill in lots of these authoritarian regimes, every, all the different candidates to yeah. succeed them start loitering around, it really make was. sure they're not out of the city. Yeah. yeah. There's a real like through line in all of our stories here, which is you can just lie and... <laughs> At least in 1133 or thereabouts, that will often lead you to power. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're not like now at all. Yeah, yeah. Right. No. Whereas now everything is totally merit based and there's like. <laughs> and society is fixed. And society in every way. is fixed and there are no problems. <laughs> That's a really interesting story about Lothair and just like being completely making up what your job yeah. is. <laughs> he faked it till he made it. He faked it till he made it. And there's a whole alternate timeline with different popes that we'll never <laughs> explore. We'll never explore. Them. <laughs> until we discover Wormhole. All right. Thanks for joining us. That's everything you'd ever need to know about 1133. Uh, if you have questions or comments, find us on Twitter or visit our website, randomlygeneratedhistory.com. Perfect. And now all that's left is to choose our next year at random. So, Will, please, can you boot up the random number generator? Yes, of course. Ooh. And as a reminder, we've set the random number generator to choose a year between 1000 BCE and 2000 CE. And our next year is... 652. <laughs> oh, 652, not 1652. Six, oh, boy. There's going to be uh, nothing that happened. This, isn't that the middle of the Dark Ages? I guess we'll find Famously out. Famously dark. Are we going to have to invent or discover or like dig in a crypt to get some, some vellum scrolls? <laughs> Sounds like a team field trip. Mm-hmm.